Motions to dismiss denied, 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 and denied. That's what happened today by none other than Judge McAfee in Fulton County, Georgia, who every single day is proving to be just an excellent judge who has complete command over the facts, over the law, over the court in the Georgia Fulton County uh, Jan 6 case that Fonnie Willis has brought against Donald Trump and uh, 18 other defendants. Now, just to remember, two of those defendants are going to trial starting next week. So that's right around the corner. We're going to get a preview of this case. And in the meantime, they are desperately, desperately filing motion after motion after motion trying to get the cases dismissed because they don't want to go to trial. This is uh, Ken Chesbro and Sidney Powell, the crazy lawyer. Uh, Ken Chesbro used to be a respected constitutional lawyer, but he's also the one who's the architect or one of the architects of the fake elector scheme and the entire uh, Jan 6 insurrection in order to steal the election, stop the electoral count, etc. And Sidney Powell's alleged to also be involved, but she's the one who broke into or orchestrated the breaking into the Coffee County, Georgia uh, um, election vote vote counting machines. And, um, and that's what they're both charged as part of this RICO, Racketeering Influence Corrupt Organizations Act, the Georgia version of this uh, Georgia RICO Act, uh, in sweeping sweeping indictment that Fannie Willis brought earlier this year. Well, the two of them elected to have a speedy trial, which means their cases start Monday and were severed from all the others. And in Georgia, everyone's entitled to a speedy trial, but in Georgia, it's like a rocket docket. You get one within months of when you request it. And so it's happening. It's starting on Monday. And in a desperate attempt to get the uh, indictments dismissed before trial, because they don't want to go to trial, they filed multiple demurrers, which is basically a motion to dismiss in Georgia and other states. They call that a demurrer, um, which is basically you're asking the court to look at the indictment and dismiss it. And so in Georgia, uh, there are several different types of demurs, and Judge McAfee gave a tutorial in this in this order, uh, in this decision and order that he rendered today on these motions to dismiss on Georgia law in the area of demurs because he knows that the whole world is reading this. And so he spoon feeds the information and spells it out for everybody so we can all understand Georgia law together and know what's being asked for, what the law is, and what his rulings are. And he's also very pithy and and, uh, smart and funny. And the best, in, in all court cases, the best information comes from the footnotes. So never miss the footnotes. I'll read you one of them uh, in a minute when we get to it. But let's talk a little bit about the substance of this motion to dismiss or this demure uh, motions that were filed by uh, Ken Chesbro and Sidney Powell. So basically, they uh, they filed multiple demurs themselves on different grounds, and they also adopted several motions of their co-defendants saying, you know, the, the me too, like, oh, yeah, yeah, me too. I like that motion. I'm going to adopt that. And I want you to consider that against me too. And so the judge always has to fish through the soup of all these motions. Okay, you filed this, Ken Chesbro, and you filed this other one, Ken Chesbro, and you filed this motion, Sidney Powell. Oh, but you also want Defendant Smiths. You're adopting you're adopting uh, their motions as well. Okay, let me look at that and see how that applies to you. And so he's come out with his 18-page order where he basically says the defendants uh, who filed these demurrers have collectively filed multiple ones and adopted the motions of others, saying essentially that um, – Every count, every charge in the indictment against them is defective. And um, they had oral arguments about some of them. And they wrote and on some of them. And they they really, really desperately want these to be dismissed because they filed legal briefs, they had oral arguments, and they're making these motions. And the judge said, after reviewing the law, the record, and the party's arguments, the court finds that each alleged challenged count is facially sound and the motions are denied. And so he then goes on to explain exactly what the law is and what they're talking about. So a demurrer is a way to make sure that the state's charging document satisfies the constitutional mandates of due process and the Sixth Amendment because the the accused shall enjoy the right to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation. So it basically means state, you've charged the defendant with a crime. 
You have to allege each and every element of that crime and then facts to support that so that the defendant's on notice of what he did and what he's being charged with for a couple of reasons. Number one, so he can adequately prepare for his defense. Number two, so he's on notice of what he's being charged with. Number three, so that he, if he were to plead guilty to each and every thing alleged, it has to make out the elements of a crime. Otherwise, that would be insufficient because it's not enough in there. And then also for double jeopardy reasons, because if later he's being charged with something related to that offense, you want to know whether or not he's already either pled guilty or or been acquitted or, or found guilty of that particular set of facts as applied to that particular law to see if jeopardy attaches. So, so it is important to, um, to allege specific facts in an indictment, but you don't have to put all your facts in there, just enough to make the indictment legally sufficient and to make uh, make out each and every element of the crime and facts to support the uh, the elements of the crime. So he then goes on to say there are diff- three different kinds of demurrers. One's a general demurrer, which says the indictment fails to allege the facts that constitute a crime. He then goes on to compare this uh, to compare this to um, a civil action where that would be a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim. And um, and that's what a general demurrer is. He says it's different than a special demurrer. Demurrer, by the way, is spelled D-E-M-U-R-E-R. A uh, special demurrer, which challenges the form of the indictment by claiming the defendant is entitled to a- additional specificity or even more information than just the basic bare bones facts. And it says that the the offense must be stated with sufficient certainty and a bill of particulars, which is basically when you tell a defendant more facts, uh, you know, so that they know more about it, that that's not a recognized pleading. And so the test for whether or not a person is, is, um, is, is, uh, entitled to this heightened um, amount of, of specificity in an indictment. It says the test is not whether the indictment could have been made more definite and certain, but whether it contains the elements of the offense intended to be charged and sufficiently apprises the defendant of what he must be prepared to meet. And in case any other proceedings are taken against him for several similar offenses, whether the record shows with accuracy to what extent he may plead a former acquittal or conviction. So that's that's what I was talking about, the double jeopardy thing, right? And he says, you can compare this for in a civil motion for a motion for a more definite statement. He said, both types of demurrers are to put the defendant on notice and protect against double jeopardy. He said, there's a third kind of demurrer called a speaking demurrer, which takes into consideration other facts outside the four corners of the indictment. Uh, and so, in other words, a charging document has just the the statutory language and the facts that are alleged. So in New York, for example, we would say the defendant is, um, let's say, let's say he's being charged with assault, which is, you know, um, which is like a physical assault with um, physical injury. You would allege the legal language first and say the defendant uh, is charged with, you know, violating penal law section, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then you'd, you'd spell out the legal language. You'd actually type the language in the statute of assault. And then you'd say the facts of which are the defendant um, punched another individual with a closed fist, in the face, causing physical injury, um, to wit, broken teeth or something like that's it. You know, that's that's the kind of facts you would allege. It's very you're alleging what it is. It's a punch to the face. You say the person's name and you say the injury, but you don't give all the facts and circumstances about what led up to it, what happened before, what happened later. That's what a trial's for. It's really, does the charging instrument is, you know, the indictment, does it give the defendant enough facts to know what he's being charged with and he can prepare for trial? Now, a speaking demurrer, what he's saying is that asks them to take into consideration all the other facts, right? Like, like other facts that you would get through other witness testimony, through telephone calls and records through, you know, electronic records, through DNA, all that other kind of stuff. He's saying, if you take all that under consideration, 
I am innocent. And this judge is saying there is no speaking demeanor that's not appropriate in a criminal case. In a criminal case, all you look at is the four corners of the charging instrument. All that other stuff, that's what a trial is for. Now, a civil case, uh, you can do that. You can look at discovery, depositions, all the other stuff that's in there. And, and that's when you would make a motion for summary judgment. And you can rule off the papers in civil cases, but, but criminal cases have a heightened standard. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. And there's just much more that goes into it. And you don't, it, it, you don't rule on the papers based on inno- guilt or innocence. It's much more, that's what a trial is for. So, so these demurs are, are whether the, whether you, the pleadings are, are sufficient. And so he then goes into, Judge McAfee goes into the, um, specific counts, right? And Chesbro seeks a general demurrer as to the RICO saying it doesn't allege a pecuni- pecuniary gain or physical threat. Uh, pecuniary gain basically just means some kind of, you get economic gain like a monetary gain or something like that, or a physical threat. And he says, because the legislative intent of Georgia Rico, the preamble says, it talks about pecuniary gain. But what what Judge McAfee basically said is, yeah, okay, that was in the legislative intent. That could just be what one senator or one legislature wanted, wanted in there. Really, what's important is what are the elements of the crime, because that's what the full legislative body and the governor voted on, the legislative language, the statute. And he then says, uh, he then cites a case, Bishop versus um, State of Georgia, that says the um, that says any attempt to discern legislative intent beyond the express language passed by a legislative body is as practical and productive as attempting to nail Jello to the wall. I love that. It came in a footnote. As I said, you get your best quotes and footnotes. Um, and Judge McAfee is just a clever guy and loves to be clever in his footnotes. He's a very smart man um, and very interesting guy. Um, so then it says, you know, the court looks to the act itself and the last sentence, you know, he looked at the RICO statute and it says the last sentence is determinative because the it says the entire chapter should be read li- liberally. It should be liberally construed by empowering the operative provisions and if the legislator legislature wanted to make the preamble binding, they could have. And they later amended the Georgia Rico case and or statute, and they didn't amend the statute saying, you know what, we incorporate the preamble, uh, you know, as a, as a requirement. So just because that's the legislative intent, then, you know, then, um, or at least one legislator's intent doesn't make it an element of the crime. He also um, goes on to uh, try to dismiss Chesbro count one, sta- saying um, other other kind of he fails to that the state fails to allege a, nex- a nexus between the enterprise and the pattern of racketeering, and he cited a Georgia case that that says um, that says that. He then goes on to talk about. Um, something called continuity. There's another general demure that Chesbro, that Chesbro uh, brought for the RICO count saying that he's failed to allege continuity. Now I read that and I thought, what is continuity? Continuity is not a term found in the Georgia RICO statute. That's what is required in the federal RICO statute. Now, other than having the word RICO in common and the type of crime that it is in common, the elements are very, very dissimilar. And Georgia courts have have said many, 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 many times, have ruled that there are a number of differences from federal courts uh, that the federal RICO um, statutes require that are very different than Georgia. And one of them is continuity. He goes on and, and analyzes that and talks about why it's not required. But again, you know, Ken Chesbro is grasping at straws and saying, oh, the federal RICO case requires continuity, um, but Georgia doesn't. Now, what is continuity? It just basically means that um, that uh, that they would, but for the fact that they were arrested, the defendant would continue the conduct, right? I, I don't really understand why why he thinks a federal statute would apply to um, would apply to a, re- a Georgia case, but that's what he's doing. And then, but that makes sense because you know, look, when you are a criminal defendant, 
typically you make these pretrial motions and 99% of the time, probably 90, maybe 97% of the time, the prosecutor wins, right? Why? Because they know what they're doing, especially in a case this big and this important. Fannie Willis is not going to n- not make sure that the pleadings are perfect, that the state, that the law is perfect. I mean, this is going to boil down to whether or not, you know, they can prove whether or not the jury believes that the defendants are guilty. She's not going to make a mistake like, you know, a, a, a pleading, you know, a mistake in the indictment, just the wording of the indictment. That's, that's, that's for a rookie move. So it's not surprising that, um, that Ken Chesbro is losing. And, you know, look, he, he's, He's making whatever arguments he can find, right? So I guess that's why he's he's arguing things that don't apply. But he's 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 doing the best he can, trying to make whatever argument he can. That's what criminal defense attorneys do. And but but uh, Sidney Powell, though, she did something different. She, in addition to making these motions and adopting them by reference. She raised many arguments in her, so I'm going to just quote from this that Judge McAfee said, Defendant Powell raises many new arguments in her reply brief that do not correspond to the state's filed response, such as general demurs to indicted counts with which she is not even charged. These arguments were submitted well after the motion's deadline imposed in the case, and if not addressed by this order, are denied as untimely. I mean, so she's just, she's making arguments about motions to dismiss charges that she's not even charged with. So this woman, you know, look, she's always been the crazy lawyer. They called her, you know, the team crazy, but she, uh, she's filing motions that aren't even, uh, you know, she's filing to dismiss counts that she's not even charged with. So she doesn't know what she's doing. And she's clearly not a real lawyer, a serious lawyer. And, and her, her pleadings show that, but she argues that count one Rico, you know, the Rico charge is defective against her. Her. And she then also talks about the other um, other things that are that that she's charged with that are defective. But one of the things she says was that look, I'm not charged with any of these predicate acts. And RICO, if you recall, requires a, that that the defendants commit a predicate act or a crime in furtherance of RICO. She's like, I'm not charged with any predicate acts. So how is it that I can be charged with RICO if if that's a requirement of RICO? And Judge McAfee says, look, whether you do it or not doesn't matter. Okay, Sidney Powell, because each actor in a RICO conspiracy is responsible for the actions undertaken by all the other co-conspirators in furtherance of the conspiracy. There's no requirement in RICO conspiracy case that the state prove that a particular defendant personally committed the underlying predicate offenses, just that one of the co-conspirators did. So uh, so that's that's how she's uh, why he denied that against her, and she then also goes on to say, um, basically, she she goes on to say, look, judge, um, please dismiss these counts against me because I was allowed to do this. I was allowed to uh, I was allowed to break into the the um, voting rolls and the voting machines. And then she attached seven transcripts from civil depositions saying, look, these all said I can do it. And the judge says, now you're trying to do a speaking demur. Remember we talked about that where they look at evidence outside the four corners of the charging document. And he said, that's what a trial's for. If you have a defense, go to trial. That's what evidence is for. But this is not, we don't do speaking demurs here where you, where I consider other evidence that haven't been proved. People haven't sworn under oath in front of me in court and a jury gets to decide. So, so stop attaching all this other extraneous evidence, put it on at trial, put your money where your mouth is and prove it at trial. If you're really innocent, then, then that's what a trial is for. So, uh, so in addition to other kind of, kind of, um, uh, technical legal arguments. Those are the highlights of this, of this motion to dismiss, uh, motions to dismiss that were denied in total, summarily denied by Judge McAfee. What does that mean? It means we're going to trial and the trial is going to be televised and we will be there and 
to offer you commentary and to tell you what things mean and what they don't mean so that you can tell exactly uh, how important are these things, what's happening, and we will translate it for you. That's what uh, me and my co-hosts, uh, Michael Popak and Ben Mizalis, do with Legal AF, and we will do it for this trial and all the other places where the intersection between law and politics sits. Thanks so much for joining. I'm Karen Friedman Agnifilo with Legal AF. Join us every Wednesday and Saturday. Hey, Midas Mighty, love this report? Continue the conversation by following us on Instagram, at Midas Touch, to keep up with the most important news of the day. What are you waiting for? Follow us now.